All right, we're, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, on the right-hand corner um, of this desk up here in the front, uh, there will be a quiz each week, and uh, the sooner you get in to take it, the more likely you are to complete it, which just reminds me that uh, you get out of this class what you put into it. And so what, the way we design this is that there is uh, homework. You go home, you answer the questions, you come in, and you're ready to, uh, to respond and inter interact uh, uh, regarding the teaching of the confession. Um, so it's important that you do that. What if you don't get it done? Um, I think you should come on anyway. I think that there's, um, what I'm saying is that I, the, you're going to get more out of it the more you put into it, it's just like any other class. So if you do the reading, you answer the questions, you memorize the catechism, uh, this is going to be much more profitable for you if uh, your life situation is such that um, you have very little time during the week, but you can come on Wednesday nights, then please do come, regardless. And then you can just be a part of the discussion and enter into the interaction, and uh, uh, hopefully you won't display the, your total ignorance of what you should have read. Uh, so so uh, what I want to do at the outset is I just want to take you through the notebook to make sure that everybody understands um, what, what we are doing. And I want to make sure your cell phones are turned off. Um, so in this, just like any other uh, Christian gathering, um, particularly that involves instruction and scripture and preaching and teaching, uh, we want to pray and ask for God's blessing on what we are going to do. Um, uh, one other thing is that um, we have uh, extra three ring notebooks, and they're all gone. Uh, so some of you didn't pick one up during the week, that's fine. Uh, and then we have several packets for men who already had three ring notebooks from previous sessions. Your, your notes are really quite dated. So you probably, um, you probably want the new notes anyway. But if you already have your answers written into the old questions and all that, and you don't want to do that, then uh, you can just pick up the new guts if you think that would be good. Um, otherwise, just use your... Uh, your, your old uh, material. So let's, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, uh, we, we look to Jesus who is the true vine and who teaches us what we will know, that apart from him we can do nothing. And, and so we pray, uh, O oh Lord, that you will break down whatever barriers are in our hearts to receiving the fullness of your truth. Uh, teach us, instruct us, show us the way that we should go. Um, we pray that the result of study uh, here would be that uh, we would grow in the love and knowledge of Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, so we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, let's start on um, what is a page, uh, Roman numeral three, that gives you the time. I want you to, if you would, put an asterisk by sessions eight, 11, and 15. Uh, so we meet um, on Wednesday nights, ex with those exceptions, those are in connection with travel weeks for me, and so we have to double up on those weeks. Hope that won't be too much inconvenience for anyone, um, if, uh, th if that's something that we have to do, because uh, it is something that we have to do. All right, the format is you come in a little bit early, do the quiz, we'll go over a few minutes, they'll let you finish the quiz, and uh, then we'll just jump into the study for the better half of two hours. We'll take a break in the middle. There are always going to be goodies in the back, um, uh, tip, particularly some gorp and then, you know, chocolate M&Ms and that sort of thing. Really healthy stuff back there for you and various chips and things. So there's no meal, but there's a lot of snacks. And so on the break especially, you want to help yourself, that's fine. We'll take, I don't know, five minute, 10 minute break and then we'll come back and we'll, we'll complete. Uh, so the procedure is I've gotten really lax with my old age about I'm just going to randomly call on you to answer the questions. That used to create a tension that I really liked in this room. Um, but I'll be a little more merciful about that and just ask for raising of hands. Resources, um, you need to have a notebook. That's the main thing. And in the text of the notebook, the studies, is the confession. So in one sense, it's all self-contained. In another sense... 
Um, we have these. Uh, these are, I called it the PCA edition. It's, I think, now the OPC edition, regardless. Uh, it has the, uh, the extra bonus of having the scripture proofs underneath, and it also has the larger catechism and shorter catechisms. So you may want to pick one of these up. I advise it. Um, you, you may take one. Um, and then there's this, uh, G.I. Williamson. Uh, it gives uh, a, a brief and succinct and helpful explanations of the entire confession uh, throughout. So it's his exposition. It's not required. It's just help if you want to, again, go into things in more depth. Um, this notebook is actually going to be published by Banner of Truth. Uh, the reason why I think this is inadequate is because he writes in a historical vacuum. And uh, I'm attempting to be more um, direct. There's a chair right there if you'd like, uh, I believe. That's an open spot. Um, I'm trying to be more direct about uh, the context, the setting, um, the theologians, the ideas that were being batted around at that time. So he does explain the theology, but he doesn't really give the context, and he doesn't illuminate their meaning by looking more carefully at uh, really what was meant by the authors of the confession at the time that they were writing. Um, uh, since then, particularly just in the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a lot published uh, on the basis of the other writings of the Westminster divines that th sheds a lot of light on the meaning of the confession. So that's part of the reason why I went ahead and wrote notes uh, for this. I've been teaching this now since 1986. So we've been, we've been over it and over it and again and again and again. And uh, Frankie Daniel has taken the class every time. He needs more remediation than any other single person. Uh, but he'll be back next week. He's not here this week. He's camping. Um, and he'll join us uh, probably for all, all of these sessions. Then there is this. We, we have not ordered it for you. There's the edition by the Free Church of Scotland. And then there's the Banner of Truth edition. The advantage of this is that it has the other documents that the Westminster Assembly produced, the Directory of Worship, the Directory of Church Government, uh, which we'll talk about more in a, in a few minutes. All right, so you can turn the page. Um, introductory session, I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, the page Roman numeral five gives just a bunch of books. Uh, just this is mainly the stuff that's made an impact on me, and uh, and uh, so I just if you if you want to look in further into these areas, uh, Roman numeral number seven, uh, that's um, the officer training. If you're doing this as officer training, we want a biographical sketch. The sooner you get that in, the better. If you please, the next page is. Um, is, uh, do I have it right that it's an outline of the qualifications and responsibilities? Yes. Um, so that gives you an idea of qualifications and responsibilities for deacons and elders, uh, beginning with character qualities at the top and then uh, duties at the bottom. And then uh, page 10 uh, is the qualifications or questions for, uh, to guide you in writing of your spiritual pilgrimage, your Christian experience. So if you go back uh, to that uh, introductory page, number, where did it go? Num number, number four. Uh, so we've done a review of the materials. Um, so part of what I have to say is very much directed toward those who are um, being recommended for office or are considering future in the future serving as an officer, which is a, a, a thing that we're told to aspire to do. Um, I'm going to talk about the privilege of service some. Titus 1, 5 and following, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13, gives us the qualifications of officers. Uh, let's, re let's read together Titus 1, beginning at verse 5. The Apostle Paul says... And this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order. That's really the point of the pastoral epistles. 
Uh, the Apostle Paul is putting things in order. He anticipates his imminent death, and so he is putting things in order in the church for its ongoing life after his departure, the departure of the ap apostles, and with their departure, um, the, the um, emptying of the church of apostolic authority. So he's leaving behind, behind he and the apostles scripture and a structure and order uh, for the ongoing life of the church. And that includes, of course, the government of the church. Uh, so what does that mean? Now, appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So why are we Presbyterians? Because elders are presbyters. That's the Greek word behind um, the uh, English uh, elder. So fundamental to what the apostle is setting up is a, is a, is a government by elders. Not ruled by individuals like bishops, but elders, plur a plurality of godly men who are going to carry on um, the exercise of authority in the church. Uh, so elders are to be appointed and um, subsequent generations, elders are to be elected in every town as I directed you. So here are the qualities. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers. And, and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, that's the word bishop. So this is why Presbyterians have said bishops are elders, elders are bishops. There isn't a separate office of, of, uh, of bishop. Elder is the office, bishop is the function to oversee, to shepherd. For an overseer, what he calls an elder in verse five, as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick tempered or a drunkard, or violent, or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict. And that last verse is uh, the core of what we believe is the difference between a deacon and an elder. An elder is somebody who's able to exhort and refute, able to exhort in sound doctrine, refute those who contradict, they have a, a, a teaching ability. It doesn't mean classroom teaching, but it means that when somebody comes up to him and says, uh, why do we do this? Why do we practice that? He's able to give a competent answer to the question. So we're not saying classroom lecturers. All the elders must be classroom lecturers. Not at all. But we are saying that an elder has the capacity to articulate the faith in such a way as to explain what we believe and, and then negatively to explain what we don't do and what we don't believe and why we don't believe it, um, and refuting those who challenge uh, our, our beliefs and, and practices. So you can see high moral uh, standards, high quality of family life that demonstrates the high moral standards and the ability to lead by the leading of uh, life in the home that transfers then over to life in the church. So the who, what, and why of officer training, who, uh, anybody who is um, new and uh, is recommended for office but has not been through the class and then anyone else who's interested, everybody is welcome, whether or not you are considering office or not. Um, so we've gone over the outline in the calendar. Um, why is it that we ask this of officers in particular? And you could say some of these reasons apply just why it's good for most uh, any of our men to take this class. Um, one is the time involved. I think that this is a good reflection of the time involved in being an officer. If you can't commit to being at this class, you probably can't commit to doing the duties of office. You know, this is two hours a week, and that's pretty good, that's a pretty rough guide. So eight hours a month uh, of one duty or another, don't have time for that, probably don't have time to be a deacon or an elder. Uh, vows and subscription, to be an officer of this church, you have to subscribe it to the confession in its totality. Uh, there's a place for exceptions. If you have exceptions, you have to declare them. But how can you take vows if you don't know what the confession teaches? How can you vow to uphold uh, the confession if you don't know what it says? So I served a church, a very conservative, evangelical, Presbyterian church in Coral Gables, Florida, the Granada Presbyterian Church. Um, and they had wonderful elders, uh, none of whom had ever studied the Westminster Confession of Faith, and all of them had subscribed to it. And that was fairly typical of the churches that formed the PCA. 
They were standing for the confession. Mainly what they were standing for was the inerrancy of scripture, scriptural authority. That was really the divide in the old Southern Presbyterian Church, out of which most of the PCA came. Uh, and they, were, they, they, they claimed to be defending the confession, but it was ironic. Most of them had never studied it, never read it, didn't know what its contents uh, taught, just knew that's what we always believed. Um, and I, I'm, not, I'm not mocking that. I mean, we helped form a church in um, Beaufort, South Carolina, on the backs of a bunch of men who hardly knew what the creed was, but they knew they believed it. Um, and they were standing for the creed, and they knew their church had deviated from it. And uh, so, um, and they knew the Bible was true. That was about it. Bible's true, and we believe the creed. So we want a different church than the one we're now in. So we, the, then the whole process of teaching begins. So you, you vow, to, you subscribe to the con confession when you serve as an officer. Uh, personal edification. Um, for reasons I'll get into in a few minutes, I think that you'll find that this is personally edifying for you. There is much that is theological at the theoretical, pure theological level, and then there is so many ramifications and ripples all throughout all of life that I think you'll find very, very edifying. Um, uh, uh, prep preparation for uh, office, again, the responsibility to lead in a Presbyterian church uh, built on the foundation of the confession as the subordinate standard to scripture, uh, then it, uh, you need to know what the confession to be able to serve people who assume that you believe the confession uh, and, and subscribe to it. Um, so here are some um, uh, anomalies and disqualifiers, and then I'll come back to format. So again, the, the, speaking directly to those who would like to stand for office, here are some automatic disqualifiers. We will not ordain or install anyone for whom one of these five things are true. Number one, if you don't attend a Sunday night service, you will not be an officer here. Uh, and if you become an officer and then don't attend and then you try to re-up, uh, there will be a lot of serious questions and pushback, and you probably won't make it. Um, wh why? Well, because the, we as a church believe the Sunday night service is normative, that we're called to morning and evening prayer on the Lord's Day, and that that's been the case uh, throughout the whole history of the whole church, and it continues to be the case today. Uh, and so that's what the program that we have in place. We have a morning service. We have an evening service. Um, and so if you are not a part of that, that means that you are, as a leader, in a position in which you are exemplary in conduct, you are minimizing the value of the Sunday night service. Same goes for the next item, Sunday school. And what you're really saying is, okay, Sunday school is not the same as Sunday morning, Sunday night. I think it's uh, something that uh, the church has put in place because we think it's good for the edification of the saints, whereas we think Sunday morning, Sunday night are required, divinely authorized, or divinely commanded. Um, uh, Sunday school, it's, uh, it's of a lesser order, but nevertheless, we think it's important for the edification of God's people. We've put that in place. You don't participate in it. Then what are you saying uh, to the people? You're a leader in the church, and you think it's unnecessary. You're not a part of it. You're not committed to it. Well, then I guess I don't need to be either. So really, you're in conflict what, with what the church thinks is, uh, is, 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 is important. So uh, Sunday night service, uh, Sunday school, and here's, here's the other factor, I think, to consider. The elders and deacons make decisions about those things. All right, about the Sunday, Sunday morning service, Sunday night service, the Sunday school. How are you going to make a decision about those things if you're not involved in them? Uh, and what, uh, what is going to be the outlook of the members of the church when they find out that the elders are making decisions about the Sunday school and about the Sunday night service and they're not there to attend and be the victims of their decisions? Uh, so it's, uh, if you're gonna make decisions about the program of the church, you need to be a part of the program of the church. If you're not a part of the program, you shouldn't be making the decisions. I think that's just obvious. Uh, all right, um, if your wife is inactive, uh, if we go back to 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, there, the, the, the wives there, we think those are not uh, women deacons. We think these are the wives of the elders the elder, or, the, or the deacons who have wives. Um, the, the, their qualifications are listed too. 
So there are qualifications for the wives of those who are going to serve as officers. And so if you have a wife who is not a part of the life of the church, not involved in church, it's going to uh, hamper, there's certain things you're gonna have great difficulty doing. It's gonna be hard to be hospitable. And that hospitality is one of the qualifications. Uh, so if your wife is not involved, we're prob probably not going to make you ordinarily, to use a good Presbyterian word, ordinarily, uh, you will not uh, be uh, made an officer of the church. You don't tithe. We, we teach tithing here. Uh, so officers are to lead by example. That's the First Peter 1, 5, uh, 5, 1 to 5 passage. Um, uh, lead by example, uh, we, we call on our people to tithe. We think tithes are normative. A tithe is a, a tenth of your increase, your profit, not what you have, but what you make. You don't tithe, uh, then you're not leading by example, and uh, you really shouldn't be in a leadership position in the church. Um, you don't observe the Sabbath. We teach the Sabbath. We think that God commands a Sabbath rest from all of our worldly recreations and employments. And we, there's a whole chapter on the Sabbath, and we'll get to that and see what the exceptions are. Um, as, because there are exceptions, works of necessity and mercy and piety are accepted. Uh, so our, our view of the Sabbath command is a, a Sabbath devoted wholly to the things of God implies that it is necessary for our spiritual well-being that we have a day devoted to the things of God. In other words, it's not arbitrary. The Sabbath was made for man, for our well-being, and of course our well-being above all would be our spiritual well-being. A day in which we set aside all of our secular activity, all worldly recreations and employments, and we give ourselves wholly to the things of God. Uh, and so if you're not able to do that and be exemplary in that, then you shouldn't serve in a leadership position in the church because that is the position of our church. That's how, what we understand the Bible to teach. And that is indeed what our confession teaches to which you will subscribe. Um, so those are the disqualifiers. All right, let's go to format now. Format. So Go to the section that's entitled Studies. So we have divided this up into 15 studies over the course of 15 weeks. The idea is you come in each week having answered the questions. You come in each week prepared. Um, so that's a page that's still Roman numeral one, all right? And um, you see it's the, the materials are divided into uh, introductory materials, the outline of the study. You see what, that's what's coming ahead each week for you, then testing tools, uh, then some appendices, and um, et cetera. All right, keep, keep turning pages. All right, so here's, here's lesson one. You have an introduction, page number one, right? It looks like this. All right, that's where you should be. So you have um, an introduction that goes over the, these matters of pace, uh, format, pace, text, and so forth, and keep turning pages. I'm sorry, I, I've got ahead of you. Um, here is where I want you to be. Historical background no notes, study number one. All right, so th that introduces notes. And so that's page seven, page eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, up to page 18 are the notes. So those are there for your help. Um, you, you, don't, uh, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to, to read the notes even. Okay, you got Williamson to help, you got the notes to help. Then the next page in your notebooks should be the quiz. 
like this. So that's then what you would work on. You, you would have worked on that coming in today. Text and questions, front and back, and, and then at the bottom there is a reading list for historical background. All right, a any questions about uh, any of that, about what we're talking about? So each week you do the study, uh, the, the next week's study, answer the questions, come in, get, uh, I'll give you a quiz on that, and then we'll go through all the questions one right after the other. Yes, question in the back. Uh, this wasn't due today, was it? Yeah. 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 You, sorry, I'm going to have to give you a zero. <laughs> Uh, and so ordinarily, um, I'll collect the quizzes, um, or maybe I won't, uh, but we'll then go over the quiz, uh, and, um, and then we'll get into the next study. Okay, again, so any questions about uh, what we are looking at so far? Don't be shy. Yes? So are we going to cover today's Lesson, are we going to cover study number one or are we going to cover study number two? Study number one. So you will have gone home and worked on that. You will come in prepared. Um, I will quiz you on it. We'll then go over the quiz and then we'll go over the questions that you will have studied at home. All right, so you're always one week ahead of what's going to be featured that week. Uh, okay. But this week, I'm not going to go over the quiz because I think, I, I think that was confusing to a lot of us. And um, so I don't, I don't think we necessarily need to do that. Okay, a, a couple of other things I want to say about it. Um, this is a full room. Um, and uh, we'll have more chairs next time. Um, but History, history shows me, or would, would lead me to believe, that by the time we get to the end, there will be half of your numbers. So I just want to put in a word for perseverance. This is, you know, it's three months plus two weeks out of your life. Uh, I just want to say, if you can bear down and, and, and follow through on this right to the end, um, the, there's a cumulative impact because the later chapters, this, they start becoming more and more pastoral and practical as you get through the sort of the heaviness of, of doctrine of God and decrees of God and creation and providence and so forth. It gets more and more practical as you go along. And I think that if you persevere and keep up and, and work at it and get to the end, uh, you'll, you'll see that uh, by the time we finish that you have really you come to the point that you grasp so much more of what the Bible is all about than you ever did before. So pers persevere, persevere. Don't be one of those who ha is forced to drop out um, if you can avoid it. Yeah, yes. um, the uh, one point that was left out of your introductory discussion uh, session quiz, the lifetime call. Could you explain what that means once you go through this? The, uh, I'm not sure where I me mentioned that, but a lifetime call uh, refers to the offices of the church. An elder is always an elder. A deacon is always a deaker. deacon. Deaker. Deacon. Um, you don't, um, because you rotate off. We have a rotating system in this church where you get a sabbatical every once every four years as a deacon, once every six years as an elder. Um, when, you're, when you have rotated off and you're not actively involved in the administration or the leadership of the church, you are still a deacon and still an elder. So you're a de deacon for life, you're an elder for life. So, so you're representing that office for this church for the rest of your life, or does that mean you would be called back into service whenever needed going down the road? Yes, both. Both, both. Okay. both. Um, yes, and, and um, you know, we draw upon the for, uh, "Quote unquote former deacons uh, to usher. We call upon our, even our elder emeritus to be there at funerals. There, a lot of them are retired, and they can be daytime funerals where some of the younger men who are, you know, working are not able to be. So, 
Um, and we had uh, the older elder emeritus were part of the session of the Buford Church that met you know, once a month over a period of a couple of years. Because again, they could go over there during the day and um, help get that church uh, started. So you are an elder for life. You are never, you're always on call to help to, with uh, the ongoing life of the church at any point in which that is needed. Okay. You're always in the reserves. Yes, that, that might be a good way to put it. So to follow up, if we do miss a quiz or a session, do we need to make that up? Uh, that's, uh, do you need to make up a session if you miss? It's up to you. I mean, again, I think the value of the class is in your hands. If you want the most benefit from it, then you'll work ahead, you'll do the work, and then, um, you know, you'll look at the, the, we have the older videos, and you can, you can look at those and, and uh, see how the discussion basically went in the past. Uh, this, this, this session is two, week longer, two weeks longer than it's ever been before. Um, uh, that was a, as a result of me thoroughly revising all of this. So every year I have been adding notes, doing more reading, adding notes, adding notes. So this has gone on, like I say, for 35 years. Um, and I got to the point where I, I could see that, that at certain junctures we were just, we had just too much to do. So I've tried to spread it out a little bit better. Uh, but it does get, it starts off fairly easily. Just again, the warning, it gets, a, it gets, it gets, a th uh, there, uh, there are more questions to answer and more difficult questions as we get along, go along. <coughs> any other, any other questions about what we're doing, how we're doing it, format, um, what it means for those who want to stand for office? For us? Another one? Another question? Um, it's in the introductory part about it becoming very relevant to daily life. Does that get applications from the Westminster Confession into daily Christian living? Is that more so the deeper you get into it as well? Or yeah, we're going right? to see. We'll see that when we go through the questions. Okay. Uh, we're going to make some. Um, yeah, the notes, um, you know, attempted to demonstrate that. So the first session, uh, the first study, is about the the history and the character of the confession, and so we're going to get into that. Uh, here and as, as soon as we finish with this, uh, Matthew. So when we persevere and we've made it through this class, what will it look like at completion? Cumulative quiz? Well, for those who stand for officers, the final exam. They'll be four inches tall. Is that what you They're going to have an opportunity to do the cumulative exam, then get the four. At the end of the session, for those who stand for office, there is an oral and a written exam. You submit a written exam, and then you are examined by the session orally. And it sounds more it, intimidating than it is. It's a rite of passage in this church meant to, meant to just scare off the faint of heart. <laughs> yes? Is this a session? Are you referring to the whole congregation or is this a council? All right, good, good question. The session, what is the session? Uh, to, the Congress is in session, so Congress has taken their official seats and are acting as, you know, the legislative body of the nation. And so uh, 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 at some point in time, the elders seated uh, to exercise the duties of office came to be known not just as the elders in session, but the session. So session is the Presbyterian word for the elders, the group of elders who are responsible for the affairs of the church. <coughs> Any other questions? All right, well, let's go then to question number one. In what year did the Westminster Assembly first meet, and what were the political circumstances? Anybody offhand know the answer? Huh? 1643. All right, all right. 1643. And what are the surrounding circumstances? Outbreak of civil war. All right, okay, there's civil war. Civil War in England. Uh, so I, I want to um, spend a little bit of time just kind of setting um, uh, the historical setting in, in a much broader perspective. Um, so we divide history 
uh, historians do into the the ancient the ancient world. So be the you know the, the um, you know the Egyptians, but in particular the for our purposes the Greco Roman world. And this is the world into which the church was born. Jesus came as a subject of the Roman Empire. Uh, you know that for Luke chapter 2, all right, in the year of Caesar Augustus, you know, a census was taken of. So this, this is the world of the patristic, following the apostles, the patristic church. Uh, it, it, it's from the period of, you know, 30 to you know, what do I want to call it? Roughly, um, s certainly, let's just take 313, 313 AD. And uh, so this is the period in which the church is launched. This is uh, uh, the church in which it's heavily persecuted. Uh, people like uh, Polycarp and uh, Ignatius are, you know, burned at the stake and thrown to the lions. Um, the church continues to grow. It continues to expand. Um, I think that Rodney Stark in his book, The Rise of Christianity, pretty much has, uh, has uh, demonstrated the fact that the Christian church, because primarily because of its, or, or to a significant degree, put it that way, of its views of marriage and family in 300 years is able to overtake the Roman Empire. One of the reasons why Constantine converted was because the Christians were the majority in the population. And one of the reasons why it was the, popul when the majority was certainly the message certainly the faithfulness of proclaiming the gospel, but also because of population decline in the Roman Empire because of, um, of uh, non-reproductive sex throughout the empire, marriage, uh, men were avoiding marriage, homosexuality and, and uh, uh, pedophilia was, was, uh, was widespread um, and as a marriage, uh, uh, had, uh, women had no protection whatsoever. Many women were dying by, uh, because of botched abortions, so there was a decline in the female population. Infanticide was practiced widespread, especially with female babies. Uh, so the pagan population of Rome was declining. The Christian population uh, was, was growing, and uh, it took 300 years, but in 300 years they overtook the Roman Empire, and they were the majority population. Uh, why? Because they didn't allow divorce, uh, because uh, they limited uh, sexual relations to marriage, husband and a wife who were bound together uh, for life. They didn't allow abortion. They didn't allow infanticide. So Christians grew. Families grew. Marriage beds the most effective means of evangelism uh, in the history of the church and remains so to this day. And so it overtook the Roman Empire. So the next period we talk about is uh, after this uh, patristic uh, subsection is, is the period of doctrinal formulation, which is basically the period from 313, let's just call it 500. So the church had been on the run, the church had been persecuted off and on for this 300 years. Finally, uh, the Edict of Milan is issued by uh, Constantine following the Battle of the Milvian Bridge in which he legalizes Christianity and you know 70 years later Christianity is the only legal religion in the empire and during this period then the theological issues are settled in particular the doctrine of the Trinity uh, the doctrine of the dual nature of Christ uh, among others uh, but uh, there's a whole host of groups that are declared to be um, heretical and they are excluded from the church, the Apollinarians and the Nestorians and um, the Arians and, and so forth are declared to be unorthodox and, and are removed from the church and the, 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 the church formulates the Nicene Creed and the Athanasian Creed and uh, the Chalcedonian Creed, which solidifies its understanding of the dual nature of Christ, truly God, truly man, uh, union, uh, the union without confusion of the human and the divine in the person of Jesus Christ and the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, one God, three persons, uh, Father, Son, and, and Holy Spirit. Uh, so after that, in the Middle Ages, uh, Middle Ages, roughly 500 to, I don't know, let's just call it 1350, uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, the Christianity advances uh, up into uh, Western Europe, Central Europe, Eastern Europe. Uh, basically, Europe is conquered 
uh, by the church, including Britain. Uh, and Christendom um, is the result. A whole civilization uh, which is governed by Christian ethic and dominated by the Christian calendar uh, uh, and uh, even warfare is regulated um, uh, by um, Christian, uh, Christian teaching. So there's a lot about the Middle Ages that we don't like, but there is also a lot to be grateful for about the medieval church. Uh, for all of its failings, uh, you know, the, the development of the papacy, the development of monasticism, the, the, we, we don't agree with those, but nevertheless, Europe um, was evangelized and Christianized so that we can speak of Christ kingdom, Christendom. Uh, the late Middle Ages, also known as the Renaissance, there is this movement of uh, ad fontis, Latin to the sources, to the fountain, this fountain, the source. Uh, so this is a period on the one hand of, of uh, 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 corruption um, in the church of a financial as well as sexual nature, popes having multiple children through uh, mistresses. So it's morally, it's the church is at a low ebb um, at the same time, there is, has been this revival of learning. So if you keep in mind the figure of, of, um, of, of, of uh, uh, architects digging around in the ruins of Rome, trying to figure out how you, how you build a vaulted ceiling, for example, what we have it in, in the interior of our church. We have a vaulted ceiling. How do you do that? So they're digging around in the ruins. How do you build a dome like we have on our city hall? So neither of these have been developed during the Middle Ages, and yet they knew that the Romans had them. So if you think about digging around in ruins, trying to figure, figure out how you do things that were done in the classical world, how did they do sculpture, how did they do painting, and then you apply that to literature and to religion, uh, this is the period in which the Greek of the New Testament it receives new emphasis, the Hebrew of the Old Testament. For a thousand years, scholars in the West had not read the Bible in anything other than Latin, the Latin Vulgate. They didn't read the, the New Testament in its original Greek or the Old Testament in its original Hebrew. So they are going back to the sources. They're even reviving classical Latin. Uh, the church used what uh, today we call ecclesiastical Latin. They're going back and reading Cicero and the classical authors, which is a more refined Latin. And so as they're going back to the New Testament and Old Testament and the original languages, they start to see discrepancies between what had been misleading in the Latin Vulgate, but which now is being clarified and corrected in the original Greek and in the original Hebrew. And so it begins these calls for reform of the church. You know, for example, penance, do penance is one of the Latin Vulgate translations, which, which led to the, a, a whole um, sacrament of penance as opposed to repent, which has a different meaning than do penance as though that were a, you know, a series of works that one would do as opposed to, you know, a heart grieving after and turning, uh, grieving because of and turning, turning away from sin. So there's this whole host of things now because the Bible is being read in the new, in, in, in the original languages, there, there are these calls to reform the church, both for the moral corruption that is everywhere evident and because of the doctrinal corrections that are understood uh, to, need to be, need to be made. So this comes to a head in 1517 when Martin Luther posts 95 theses on the wall of the Wittenberg Castle Church on the door. Um, he publishes it in Latin because it's meant to be a discussion for scholars, but uh, other people translate the Latin into German and in other vernacular languages, and it spreads like wildfire all throughout Europe. A lot of it has to do with the uh, moral and financial corruptions. Um, he was very indignant that Rome was fleecing German peasants in order to build St. Peter's uh, in Rome, uh, which is exactly what was going on. Indulgences being offered when a coin, famously when a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. So you can free Aunt Mabel from purgatory while well, she'll be suffering for another 100,000 years if you just have compassion and put the coin into the, 
into the cup and she'll, their soul will spring right up in, into heaven. So this is the kind of thing that's going on. Luther is protesting it. He's one of a handful of trilinguists in the church at the time. Trilinguists. He can read Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. Uh, so there's, there's this growing group, and Luther is among them, who are trilinguists and are able to work capably in the, in the languages. Uh, eventually, 1522, Luther is excommunicated. And with him, all of his followers then pull out of the Roman Catholic Church and you really have the birth of Protestantism then. All right, so as, 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 as this, this message spreads uh, throughout the continent of Europe, it begins to be felt in, in Britain. Uh, in England, there's a, there, there's a different story. Eventually, of course, you end up with Europe divided into Protestant lands and, and Roman Catholic lands. Uh, but in England, there's a different, uh, there's a different, or more broadly, Great Britain, there's a different story. So 1534, okay, just a few years after Luther, Henry VIII uh, convinces uh, Parliament to enact the uh, Act of Supremacy, which uh, declares the king to be the head of the Church of England, that the Pope no longer has jurisdiction, but the king, um, and is that still true today, that the king is the head of the Church of England? Did anyone watch the inauguration where he swore to uphold the true Protestant religion? Well, it wouldn't have been the true Protestant religion back in 1534. So, England, in the, in, in, the, in the context of the disruption brought about by Luther, separates the Church of England from the Church of Rome. It's still Roman Catholic in every sense, except uh, the head of the church is the king and not the pope. So roughly what happens here is 100 plus years of conflict over what will be the character of the Church of England. Uh, a couple of other dates uh, just to sort of map out um, uh, the direction of things. Um, uh, 1552, 42 articles are uh, enacted as the Articles of Religion for the Church of England under Edward. The 42 articles are Protestant. So in this 18-year uh, period, the Church of England has gone from still being Roman Catholic, even though it's separated from the Pope, to being Protestant. Uh, unfortunately, young Edward dies, and Bloody Mary comes to the throne, and her reign is 1553, to 58, and Protestants are burned at the stake. So Cranmer, Ridley, Latimer, Hooper, Bradford, these men are all uh, leading uh, churchmen, leading scholars, and they are uh, burned at the stake uh, for their refusal to repent of their heretical Protestant views. Th thankfully, Mary's reign is short, and so 15, 1558, Elizabeth comes to the throne and uh, Parliament then reaffirms its Protestant identity. That has to have been confusing for the woman. Um, massively. <laughs> had, had, had to have been extremely confusing. Um, and uh, then in 1563, the 39 articles are, um, are enacted, and they are thoroughly Protestant. So th and these remain, with slight alterations, these remain uh, the doctrinal foundation of the Church of England, the Episcopal and Anglican churches worldwide. They, they may be an empty letter, but that's officially the doctrinal standards uh, for the churches. But, but what we have going on in England is a conflict between people who want a purer church following the pattern of the reformed churches abroad, by which they mean the Calvinistic churches. 
And their church, which is still uh, governed by, by bishops, still tolerates many of the trappings of the priesthood, even though the Articles of Religion are reformed. So they want a purer church. And so they go down in history known as Puritans. And they are you know, working for the reform of the church right on through. Their efforts ebb and flow. They make progress. They're, they're beaten back. They make progress. They're, beat, they're beaten back. Um, you go from Edward to, to Mary to Elizabeth to James I. They put high hopes on James I. He was a Scottish monarch who becomes the king of, of England and Scotland. Uh, and he hates Presbyterianism. He hated the strictness of his tutors and wants uh, nothing really to do with it. Um, and he puts in, in place in 1633 as the Archbishop of Canterbury, the, head of the, the um, religious head of the Church of England under the, un, under the, the, the King Archbishop Laud, L-A-U-D, who turns up the heat on the Puritans. Some 20,000 of them go to North America because of the persecution, because the heat is uh, turned up on them um, during uh, the decade of the, of the, of the uh, 1620s and into, into the 1630s. 1637, he attempts to impose the uh, episcopacy and, and the prayer book on Scotland. And this, this, is, this is the legend. Uh, but the legend is that when the presiding bishop attempted to read the, the prayer book in St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh, a little uh, lady who had a fruit stand or some such picked up her stool, there wouldn't have been pews in the churches then, and hurled it at the bishop yelling, popery, popery. And they chased the bishop out of the, the city, they raised an army and drove the English out of Edinburgh and camped in Newcastle. That meant that uh, James I had, uh, now he's been followed by Charles I. Um, I should have said that Laud was Charles, who was even more uh, hostile. Charles I um, is attempting to impose the episcopacy uh, and, and sends uh, the bishop up to Edinburgh. He's forced to call Parliament. Parliament hadn't been called in 11 years. Par Parliament is in a very foul mood. Uh, given uh, the oppression of the Puritan-dominated parliament. And the long and the short of it is civil war breaks out, the parliament against the king. And so that 1643 parliament uh, calls for an assembly of divines to meet in order to reform the doctrines of the Church of Scotland. So here's the statement. Um, that uh, question number two addresses. The, the first, uh, the question number two is, what was the task first assigned by the assembly? How was their assignment changed? They were first tasked with revising the 39 articles of the Church of England. They spent a number of months doing that. However, in order to ensure the help of the Scottish army, uh, they subscribed to what's called the Solemn League and Covenant, which the Scots demanded which would, um, which then obligated the imposition of Presbyterianism throughout uh, England, Scotland, and Wales, and Ireland for that matter. And uh, so, the Solemn League required, quote, the reformation of religion in the kingdoms of England and Ireland in doctrine, worship, discipline, and government according to the word of God and the example of the best reformed churches. There's that phrase. Looking to the continent, we want our church to look like Calvin's church. Uh, the kingdoms were to be brought into the nearest conjunction and uniformity in religion under four points. <clears throat> Confession of faith, church government, worship, and catechism. So in 1645, they then redirected their work to produce a confession of faith. And they would continue doing that work for the next four years. All right, let's take a five-minute break, and then we'll go on with the rest of the questions.